So why do I think that we need religion, that we need religious faith in the globalized world? I believe that we need to ask afresh the most important question of our lives. And the most important question of our lives is not how do we succeed in this or that endeavor in the course of our lives. The most important question of our lives is how do we succeed as human beings? How do we succeed in the task of being human? Now, I believe that the great world religions are the repositories of the most enduring and most compelling ways to answer that question. Not always compatible answers, but nonetheless, most compelling. Now, I will give you an answer to the question why we need religion from the standpoint of my own experience and the faith in which I share, which is Christian faith. I bring to it two fundamental experiences. One of them was, I was giving a talk at UN at the moment when the first airplane hit one of the towers. My topic was reconciliation. And my topic was why it is that faith can bring people together and there in front of the eyes of the entire world. The proof to the contrary was delivered, namely that faith, other things were in play as well, but certainly also faith can have these extraordinarily devastated, devastating effects. The faith turned homicidal. My other experience is a few years after that. I was in Dubai, and I was a member of one of the global agenda councils of the World Economic Forum. And this was established uh, in the wake of the great financial crisis, one of the greatest uh, financial crises in entire human history. Um, many of us descended upon Dubai and discussed from various angles, participated what Klaus Schwab has described as global redesign project. And I've heard a lot about financial regulation, about economic growth, about variety of threats uh, to our economic and political systems, and so on. I was part of the Global Agenda Councils on Value and on Religion. I've heard also about inequality, many, many uh, things need for solidarity. But one thing I heard virtually nothing about, and this is about kind of the dark horse, what some Plato called the dark force of passion that often runs our soul, that pulls our soul. Arguably, it is desire gone awry that was the cause, uh, immediate cause, occasion of that entire crisis. Desire gone awry of the lenders who wanted to replace their, uh, their, their BMWs with really sparkling Bentleys or Aston Martins. Um, maybe also desire of, uh, of people who wanted to replace their rusty Corollas with their a little bit nicer Camrys, but the desire played a very significant role in this entire uh, collapse. And yet, it was not thematized. We never thought about what place do things that we produce and services that we offer, what place do they have in the entire ecology of the good life? What does it mean in today's world to live well as a human beings with everything else that we do. Two experiences. One is failure, inability of some of our major institutions to answer a very simple question about human desire and human flourishing, but truly uh, conduces to human flourishing. The other question is religion itself, gone experience, religion itself, which was supposed to answer the question of the good life, gone awry and turn homicidal. Now these are my two experiences that I bring to the question. And one way to look at these experiences is with the help of a, 
reputably most irreligious of philosophers who ever lived, and that is Friedrich Nietzsche. And what Friedrich Nietzsche talk, uh, says about nihilism. Friedrich Nietzsche was a son and a grandson of Lutheran minister, studied theology for one semester, and promptly lost his faith. <laughs> Maybe just for that reason, he had something to, has something to teach us, both about the faith, but also about societies in which we find ourselves. And one of the ideas that he has was uh, organized around the question of nihilism. I'll give my own spin to what he was saying, so don't blame Nietzsche for what I say right now. But let's divide this nihilism into two types, religious nihilism and irreligious nihilism. Religious nihilism might be something of an ascetic sort of nihilism where the human beings flee from the entanglement in ordinary life into the spheres of transcendence, leave behind everything in order to unify their souls with God. This might be something like ascetic form of, um, of nihilism. Or of the type that's closer to Nietzsche's critique of religion, where he said, religions come to the world with preset sets of laws and regulation and impose them upon the life. It's almost like giving a chokehold to the life itself because it doesn't honor, it doesn't respect the very nature of the pulsating energies of life. It's nihilistic because it denies this kind of life. And when it turns relatively violent, it can do so with crushing, uh, crushing force, as we see in many places in the world. That's a kind of religious uh, nihilism. There's this other kind of nihilism, which is not so much religious, but which is irreligious. Nietzsche thought of that kind of nihilism under the rubric of last men. It's a bit of sexist term for it. Last humans, you can translate it. And last humans are, well, what are they like? They're like um, a kind of a, um, Flaccid, placid creatures oriented toward their own pleasure. They dream their little dreams. They have their little little pleasure. No great assertion for any great kind of a, kind of a cause. Entire life organized around couch potatoy kind of uh, existence. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's the word, but you get my uh, you get my point. Now there's this other version. Uh, also of our religious uh, nihil nihilist. And this is, uh, has nothing to do with, uh, with a kind of uh, comfort, search for comfort. It has to do something with aggression in the world in which we find ourselves. It has to do with people who, in different spheres of life, want to bend the course of entire world to serve their own purposes. Walls of Warn Wall Street, uh, House of Cards uh, politicians, folks of this, uh, of this sort. There is also nihilism at work, at work here. Now, in the first case, you have a, uh, a religious case. You have people to who impose the structures of meaning upon, upon the world. And that structure of meaning does not allow the life itself to breathe. It crushes the life itself. In the second case, you have somebody who affirms the life with a full force, and yet, just by affirming life, does so in arbitrary ways. When we give meaning to individual things, when we, what we give meaning to, we can take the meaning away, and the meaning itself cannot carry our weight. And so, we, in a sense, then become uh, plagued by meaninglessness of the existence in which we find ourselves. You recall Milan Kundera, who wrote the book Unbearable Lightness uh, of Being. Everything that we do does not bear weight, and we suffer uh, from this uh, plague of nihilism. Now, these two nihilisms, you can almost think that they are struggling for our soul, individual soul, but you can almost say, that they are um, waging their war at the stage, at the world stage. On the one side, you have fundamentalists who with clutched hands hold onto transcendent meaning. 
On the other hand, you have libertarians who want to lead the way of life that they want to lead and therefore are in the struggle with the fundamentalists. Fundamentalist and pleasure-oriented libertarianism. And this struggle, in some ways, they condition one another and they go almost in a, in a circle. So you might have a, a fundamentalist who find himself or herself squeezed by the rigid structure of meaning oppose, imposed upon them and wanting to escape that and goes toward becoming a libertarian. Lives in the house of libertarians and suddenly the weight has been lifted away but the meaning has been lost at the same time. Um, pleasure is possibly there but the meaning has been, has been lost and then you have libertarians turning into a fundamentalist again. You have a circle going on like this. Nietzsche has a, uh, has a very interesting metaphor for this. For those of you who've read Thus Spoke Zarathustra, he spoke of a camel, of a lion, and of a child. Camel is the animal which bears everything. The weight of meaning of laws is upon the camel. And Nietzsche said, well, camel morphs into a lion. A lion is the one who roars, frees himself from the burden of the crushing burden of rules. But the lion doesn't stay simply lion. He said, lion turns into a child. A child is the one who wills his own will and who exists just in the play of, of moment. So his idea was, how does, the lion, how does the camel become a child? But Nietzsche didn't figure out that sometimes child would want to become a lion. <laughs> and so you've got this circle that's going, uh, that's going on. I believe that this recursive struggle of these two types of nihilism is one of the, one of the deep problems of the time in which we find ourselves. From libertarianism into pleasure-oriented libertarianism into fundamentalism and back. And so my question is, how do we find a way out of this? I want to suggest that we have to find a way which will unite the meaning and pleasure. Because meaning without pleasure is crushing. Pleasure without meaning is vapid, empty. We need the unity of the two. I want to propose to you that the unity of meaning and pleasure is to be found in God who is conceived as love. Let me try to explain this a little bit. And again, I speak as a Christian theologian. Why God? I believe that human beings are created for relationship with God in all the longings that we along in all the things that we pursue we also always already pursue God we need not be aware of this and when we realize that we pursue God only then can we find meaning of in our pursuits now we do try to find meaning in ordinary finite things of our of our lives in um, muscle tone of our bodies in steamy sex in fame in family, you name it. Varieties of things serve to us to give meaning to our life, and yet we always remind, remain partly dissatisfied because ultimately we have been created to be in contact with infinity. God, I believe, is the only proper foundation of the meaning of human life. Now, I say God is the meaning of human life, and now you immediately might ask, but why is it that God, when God gives meaning, why doesn't then God take away the pleasure? Where does the pleasure come if you affirm uh, the existence and the importance of God in human life? I think that relationship to God, in fact, in, can enhance the pleasure in ordinary things of life. I have a colleague at Yale, his name is um, Paul Bloom. He has written a book called How Pleasure Works. And in that book, he argues that 
actually we don't get pleasure from things so much as we get pleasure of what he calls essences that are attached to things. Or what one might say, relationship that attend to uh, things. So for instance, somebody will pay for John F. Kennedy's tape measure, $48,875, because just because the tape measure is John F. Kennedy's, even though it is worth only three bucks, right? So in many ways, this is how we derived our, our pleasure. My father gave me a gold Nibu Pelican uh, fountain pen. I love this pen. I can find a better pen than that. I can buy myself a better pen than, than this. But the pleasure of the pen is precisely the relationship of the father that attaches to it. Now think of it this way. To believe in God means to believe that the world is a creation of God. To believe in God means that the world is a gift of God to us. God is the giver, world is the gift, and you are the recipient. Now think about this also this way. Gift is not just the thing that you see. Gift is also the relationship. It's only when something is in relationship to me that it becomes a gift. Now imagine that you really love God. Imagine that you are a good Christian, Jew or Muslim. And imagine that you then see the world as a gift. Suddenly, everything in the world becomes alive. It's a sacrament of the relationship between God and you. Everything becomes like that pelican gold nib pen that my father has given to me, important not just in the sheer facticity of it, but important in the fact that it comes as a gift to me from the outside. Every gentle touch, every whiff of a flesh plowed earth, every distant star, everything that you can imagine is not just itself, but more than itself. And it is that because it is a gift of the divine giver. Unity of meaning and pleasure is to be found in the God who is love. That, I believe, is the reason why religion matters in the world today. And that's why I believe that religion, properly understood religious faith, can overcome this recursive battle between two kinds of nihilisms, fundamentalist and our religious liberty nihilism that plague our world today. Thank you very much.